Your Excellency, Your Highness, Reverend Fathers, Sisters, Brothers, Sisters, Friends of Life. Pope St. John Paul II's first words on appearing on the Lodge of St. Peter's Basilica on the 16th of October 1978, the day of his election, were, do not be afraid. Now, 39 years later, in light of the events that have overtaken contemporary Catholicism, his first words seem to be not only prophetic, but more a clarion call in preparation for battle. History swings. It's a pendulum that swings. Sometimes things are good. Most times I believe things are bad. That's encouragement. But whichever way the pendulum swings, God is in control. All things have been permitted by him. And it's permitted by him, first of all, for his greater glory, but also for our salvation. When things are bad, God sends us prophets. And so we have the case of the Assyrians who appeared in, in um, Judea, and God sent the prophet, Isaiah. And Isaiah's was, words were, trust God, ask for a sign. And the king Ahaz said, I will not put the Lord God to the test. Equally, when the Babylonians were at the gate of Jerusalem, a prophet was sent, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah's counsel, God says, surrender, and everything will be okay. And of course, the authorities in Jerusalem did not surrender. And we know the consequence. In our own time, God has sent not a prophet, but the queen of prophets. And she came a hundred years ago to three children, and she had a message for our time. She convinced the children, for the very first appearance, of how serious things were. And she gave the children a sign, even as Ahaz was offered the sign, the sun dancing. She gave them a vision as well, that of hell. So we have sign, a sign and a vision to help us consider how serious the message is. Some 33 years before Our Lady came to Fatima, Pope Leo XIII, on the 13th of October, 1884, had the vision after Mass, in which he heard two voices, one saying, give me power over your priests, and I will destroy your church within 100 years. And the other voice said, you have it. Pope Leo's immediate reaction was to compose the Leonine prayers for the defense of the clergy. And the battle effectively began. Aware of how desperate modern times would be and how the battle would be fought at fever pitch, the Virgin proposed a strategy. Namely, there should be a full adherence to God's law, the natural law and the divine law, the Ten Commandments. There should be prayer, the rosary, she also wanted the devotion of the five first Saturdays in reparation for offenses against the Immaculate Heart and, of course, the consecration of Russia. The children were instructed to come on the 13th of each month, and they were able to do so except for the month of August when they were kidnapped. When Our Lady appeared to them some six days later, she said, go back to the Kofa on the 13th of next month, September. She said, I will perform the miracle, but it would not be as great. Now, the miracle of the sun was, was seen by 70,000 people. It's a historical fact. 
It was seen not only by the people in the cova, but people a great distance from the cova. It was seen by children in the school some 40 miles away. It was seen even by people at sea. The consecration of Russia was requested and although there have been attempts to consecrate the world, this is not what was asked for. It's very specific, the consecration of Russia in union with the bishops. We know the case of Saul, King Saul, who was asked to put the whole of the uh, Amalekites um, Amorites under the ban. He kept a few sheep for sacrifice. He lost the kingdom as a result. Isn't obedience better than sacrifice is what the prophet told him. Our Lady spoke specifically of Russia and she mentioned that if Russia were not consecrated there would be consequences, unfortunate consequences of that. Namely, the spreading of Russia's errors, there would be the provocation of wars, there would be much suffering for the Church and for the Holy Father. And we saw at the end of the, first, of the Second World War that half of Europe was swallowed up by communism. The election of a cardinal from communist Poland at the end of the Second Conclave of 1978 was sufficiently a threat to the status quo that an attempt to eliminate him was made on the 13th of May 1981. Two years prior to his election as Pope, John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla, then the Archbishop of Krakow, delivered a prophetic message in Philadelphia on the occasion of the bicentennial anniversary of the American independence, in which he said, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church of the gospel against the anti-gospel. We must be prepared to undergo great trials in the not too distant future. Trials that will require us to be ready to give up even our lives and a total gift of self to Christ and for Christ. Through your prayers and mine, it is possible to alleviate this tribulation, but it is no longer possible to avoid it. How many times has the renewal of the church been brought about in blood? It will not be different this time. There is a growing sense, even among the least sophisticated, the spiritually indifferent and the historically naive, that something is wrong, that something has to give. In the words of W. B. Yeats, things fall apart the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Certainly, in regard to the church, it seems that the center can no longer hold. The Petrine authority has stealthily been whittled away, that it seems to no longer possess the supremacy of judicial power, but rather only that of uh, primus inter pares. One need only recall Paul VI's prohibition against communion in the hand, and the outright disobedience, if not defiance, of several hierarchies that forced him into capitulation, or the uproar and denunciations that followed his issuance of Humanae Vitae. Equally, the declaration of John Paul II against female altar servers was soon declared by a new and authentic interpretation of the Canon 230 in the Code of Canon Law to be new. Benedict XVI's Summorum Pontificum, like a lame duck, fared no better. 
Perhaps even more serious is the feeling that things ecclesiastic and Catholic are falling apart, and a pastoral anarchy has been loosed upon the church. The current media spin presents the Petrine office as little more than the opinion, even the most insouciant, of the incumbent. Yet, even in the midst of this imbroglio, there seems to be a hidden exercise of power at work that can reform the marriage annulment process without the customary consultation of the appropriate Roman dicasteries, issue a broad and scathing rebuke of the Roman Curia at Christmas, purge a dicastery's membership, which effectively vitiates the influence of its prefect, who stood firmly against innovations injurious both to the teachings on marriage and to the tenets of the liturgy, cripple the Franciscan friars of the Immaculate and shut down the Melbourne campus of the John Paul II Institute. One can hardly be blamed for judging, like Isaac, Mutatis Mutandis, that although the voice is Jacob's, the hands are Esau's. With such teachings and with unespied power behind it, it is no surprise that the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Indeed, the census catholicus is troubled, and voices that should be raised in its defense are muted, while the spirit of the age is not short of tongues that proclaim from the housetops that could well be the anti-gospel of which four decades ago Cardinal Wattila had spoken. It becomes even more dire as the Cardinal went on to warn that we should be prepared to undergo great trials in the not too distant future. Trials that will require us to be ready to give up our, even our lives and a total gift of self to Christ and for Christ. Cardinal Watira's anxiety gives us additional grounds to take the message of Fatima seriously. In August 1931, our Lord himself appeared to Sister Lucia and, referring to his command for the collegial consecration of Russia, commanded her to make it known to my ministers that given they followed the example of the King of France in delaying the execution of my request, they will follow him into misfortune. This warning, together with the Cardinal's declaration that this trial cannot be averted, is what has so many fearful. But like every passion, fear, in order to be morally good, must be regulated by reason. Into mystic thought, a passion is that motion or modification that the recipient undergoes when acted on by some agent. In human nature, a passion is that motion which arises from the senses and can even affect the body when one imagines or thinks of good or evil. One such passion is fear, which springs from the perceived threat of some present or future evil, and whose power resides in the belief that one lacks the ability to overcome the evil. In simple terms, Fear is the unsettling of the soul, a mental disturbance that regards a present or future evil as irresistible and actually able to conquer good. It can be contrasted with hope, whose object is a future good, difficult but possible to attain. St. Thomas enumerates the various manifestations of fear, such as laziness, shamefacedness, shame, amazement, stupor, and anxiety. The cause of fear may be intrinsic or extrinsic. The first three are intrinsic since they come from one's personal actions and may be defined as follows. Laziness is that response which shrinks from work for fear of the effort involved. This is characterized by the third servant in the parable of the talents, who, having hidden his talent, offered the excuse that he was afraid. He was punished for being wicked and lazy. Shamefacedness, a kind of embarrassment, is that fear that deters one from committing a disgraceful act. The parable of the steward, of the dishonest steward, who was afraid to beg, illustrates that fear. Adam hid from God because of shame for having disobeyed. 
Amazement, stupor, and anxiety are extrinsic since they have their origin in external factors far greater than one can overcome. Amazement is the fear that is felt when the threat is so great that one is unable to gauge its magnitude, whilst at the threat of an unprecedented evil, one feels stupor, even to the point of being cataleptic. Lastly, anxiety is the kind of fear produced by an unforeseen occurrence resulting from an unexpected event. Examples of these would be the resurrection of our Lord from the dead, which was a source of amazement to the disciples, stupor to the guards of the tomb who were like dead men, and anxiety to those who were responsible for the crucifixion of the Lord. Amazement and stupor paralyze the understanding, just as laziness is the paralysis brought about by fear of exertion. This implies that amazement and stupor shrink from the difficulty of grappling with a great and unwanted occurrence, just as laziness shrinks from undertaking physical toil. There is a subtle difference between stupor and amazement in that the one amazed shrinks from forming a judgment on what at present amazes him, but he will be willing to do so later. Stupor, on the other hand, places one in a seemingly permanent coma. Amazement, therefore, may be the beginning of philosophic research to which stupor is a hindrance, since the one overcome by stupor fears both to judge at present and to inquire in the into the future. For our purpose, two different kinds of fear need to be considered. First, fear may be grave if it influences a steadfast person, but slight if it affects only a person of weak will. In order, to be, in order for fear to be grave, one, it must be grave in itself and not merely in the estimation of the one fearing. Two, it must be based on a reasonable foundation. Three, the threat must be possible of execution. And four, the execution of the threat must be inevitable. Grave fear diminishes willpower, but does not necessarily remove it totally. This is exemplified by those of the disciples who, after their initial panic when Jesus was arrested, followed him at a distance. Slight fear is not considered as even diminishing willpower. Second, so the first fear is grave, the second fear is reverential. It is that disposition one has towards one's parents or towards those in positions of authority. And it springs primarily from one's reluctance to offend them. If such fear is used as a compelling force, then its justness or otherwise comes from the validity for which it is exercised. It is important to recall that fear did not exist in human nature at the time of creation, but rather it is one of the consequences of, sin, of the sin of our first parents. In the state of original innocence, Adam lived with beasts without any fear, and his relationship with God was also void of fear. Once he sinned, however, he became exceedingly afraid and he hid himself among the trees. When God called him, he responded, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. This fear arose not only from the dread of punishment, but also from shame for having disobeyed God. Human fear increased and became terror when Cain had to face the consequences of his act of fratricide. My punishment, he said to God, is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me this day away from the ground, and from thy face I shall be hidden, and I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will slay me. From the moment Cain laid violent hands on his brother, fear morphed itself into a hierarchy, namely dismay, fright, cowardice, dread, terror. Additionally, fear, arising from many sources and manifesting itself in multitudinous ways, 
has it thrown itself in the human psyche? And even more grievously, the devil uses it as a weapon to enslave and oppress us. In acknowledging the reality, and indeed the power of fear, our Lord distinguished between two kinds of fear which, to which we are subjected. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Although threats to our body may provoke many degrees of fear, these fears can all be vanquished by the holy and reverential fear. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life, that one may avoid the snares of death. Fear of God leads to awe and obedience to him, that is, to keep his commandments, to love him, and to lead a life of repentance, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Christ's counsel that we should fear our Creator above all things, it is a simple reminder of the existence of the hierarchy of fears. In particular, since death, the greatest of the natural objects of fear, is inescapable, we should be even less afraid of losing all the things belonging to this world, that is, all material goods, all social and professional advantages, all titles and dignities, which, on our departure, must, in any case, be left behind. God said to him, we are reminded, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you, and the things you prepared, whose will they be? That will keep us in, help us to keep things in their correct perspective. Moreover, our Lord merely confirmed what the heroes of the Maccabean period had already believed, articulated, and zealously practiced. The great martyr Eliezer, who was determined not to violate the ancestral laws by eating pig's flesh, vociferously rejected his friend's ploy that he should only pretend to do so. He said, Such pretense is not worthy of our time of life, lest many of the young should suppose that Eliezer, in his 90th year, had gone over to an alien religion, and through my pretense, for the sake of living a brief moment longer, they should be led astray because of me, while I defile and disgrace my old age. For even if for the present I should avoid the punishment of men, yet whether I live or die, I shall not escape the hands of the Almighty. Therefore, by manfully giving up my life now, I will show myself worthy of my old age, and leave to the young a noble example of how to die a good death, willingly and nobly, for the reverend and holy laws. This narrative illustrates Eliezer's two major fears. First was his inability to escape the hand of God, and the second, the fear of setting a bad example which could mislead the young. Interestingly, we are told that those who a little before had acted towards him with good will now changed to ill will because the words he had uttered were in their opinion sheer madness this supposed madness of eliezer was also shared by the mother of the seven sons who exhorted each and every one of them to hold faithfully to god's law and to accept a most cruel death rather than to abandon their ancestral way of life, saying, Do not fear this butcher, but prove worthy of your brothers. Accept death, so that in God's mercy I may get you back again with your brothers. The zeal and the clear-sightedness of the Maccabean martyrs should be a source of inspiration and encouragement for us especially as we are currently confronted with resolute policies that threaten to undermine and change our ancestral customs and traditional beliefs. We need to recall that even when those advocating such change seem to have the support of authority, we are not facing anything new, as the preacher once declared. 
what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. As disciples of Christ, as believers, and more, as leaders aware of our responsibilities before God, we need to become full of passionate intensity for our convictions and to proclaim, even from the housetops, the unadulterated gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is time to cleave the deepening darkness with the light of truth. Pope Paul VI spoke of the smoke of Satan having entered the church, and Sister Lucia, that the apostasy in the church would begin at the top. For the past half century, there has been a growing crisis in the church, arising as much from a lack of clear and unambiguous teaching as from the climate of dissent among priests, religious, and laity. Within the contemporary church, the crisis has been brought to fever pitch, if not breaking point, by the rejection of our Lord's yes-no paradigm and the undermining of established doctrinal positions by protean pastoral practices. One example is Bishop Fernando Akarit's pixelated declaration in defense of Amoris Laetitia, Amoris Laetitia's proposed Holy Communion for adulterers, I quote, a new pastoral impulse which requires concrete answers in continuity with the doctrine of the magisterium. The blood dim tide is loosed. As there emerges from the darkness and confusion a real and open conflict between those who remain faithful and loyal to our Lord's gospel and the increasing numbers of the uncatechized who, by adhering to the praxis of political correctness formulated by LGBT ideologues reject the Christian gospel. The open and unilateral imposition of this politically correct ideology in many parishes and dioceses is validating an anti-church that is in opposition to the Catholic Church, the true Church of Christ. The anti-gospel of the anti-church is, in many cases, indistinguishable from secular ideology, which has overturned both the natural law and the Ten Commandments, the sources that, from time immemorial, have informed and protected man's moral, spiritual, and physical well-being. This anti-gospel, which seeks to elevate the individual's will to consume, to pleasure, and to power over the will of God, was rejected by Christ when tempted in the wilderness. It's the same temptation, time and time again. It's either eat, pleasure, power. Disguised now as human rights, it has reappeared in all its Luciferian hubris to promulgate a narcissistic, hedonistic attitude that rejects any constraint except that imposed by man-made laws. Thus, approaching its fulfillment is St. Pius X's prophecy that the great movement of apostasy being organized in every country for the establishment of a one world church, which shall have neither dogmas nor hierarchy, neither discipline for the mind nor curb for the passions, and which under the pretext of freedom and human dignity, would bring back to the world, if such a church could overcome, the reign of legalized cunning and force and the oppression of the weak and of all those who toil and suffer. Cardinal Carlo Cafara, the founding president of the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and the Family, wrote to Sister Lucia asking for prayers for this new undertaking. She declared in a signed response to him that the final battle between the Lord and the kingdom of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Do not be afraid, she added, because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought and opposed in every way because this is the decisive issue. 
And then she concluded, however, Our Lady has already crushed his head. The Cardinal noted that for John Paul II, this was the crux. It touches the very pillar of creation, the truth of the relationship between man and woman and among generations. It is well known that any tampering with a keystone risks the collapse of the entire building. The keystone, the basic cell of society, is marriage and the family. With the tacit acceptance of contraception and divorce, the recent merciful embracing of remarried civil divorcees, and the benign nod to same-sex marriage, the keystone has been tampered with and the omega point has been reached. With this background, the question as to whether Amoris Laetitia should be regarded as a gauntlet thrown down or a Trojan horse naturally raises its head. For nearly three centuries, the popes have confronted the dark trinity of masonry, liberalism, and modernism, which in our time, having transmuted into atheist, atheistic secularism, has a baneful grip on all the major institutions of global influence, but particularly on education, communications, politics, and the law. Atheistic secularism has been working for the demise of the family, its driving spirit being the LGBT ideology, its public face, political correctness, its Sunday dress, inclusivity, and non-judgmentalism. St. Pius X was the first to clearly identify modernism, that subversive rebellion against fixed moral norms and religious belief, as a synthesis of all heresies and as the hidden enemy within the church. Though he unmasked modernism with his encyclical prescendi, he failed to uproot it and, like the cockle in the field, it continued growing and developing ideals, doctrines, and goals that were quite alien, if not diametrically opposed to the Catholic Church. Thus, modernism, remaining within the Catholic Church, has metastasized into the anti-church. It is self-evident that the Catholic Church and the anti-church currently coexist in the same sacramental, liturgical, and juridical space. The latter, having grown stronger, is now attempting to pass itself off as a true church, all the better to induct or coerce the faithful into becoming adherents, promoters, and defenders of a secular ideology. Should the anti-church succeed in commandeering all the space of the true church, the rights of man will supplant the rights of God through the desecration of the sacraments, the sacrilege of the sanctuary, and the abuse of apostolic power. Thus, politicians who vote for abortion and same-sex marriage will be welcome at the communion rails, where you can find them. Husbands and wives who have abandoned their spouses and children and entered into adulterous relationships will be admitted to the sacraments. Priests and theologians who publicly reject Catholic doctrines and morals will be at liberty to exercise ministry and to spread dissent while faithful Catholics will be marginalized, maligned, and discredited at every turn. Thus, the anti-church would succeed in achieving its goal of dethroning God as creator, savior, and sanctifier, and replacing him with man, the self-creator, the self-savior, and the self-sanctifier. To achieve its objectives, the anti-church, in collaboration with the secular powers, uses the law and the media to browbeat the true church into submission. By adroit use of the media, the activists of the anti-church have managed to intimidate bishops, clergy, and most of the Catholic press into silence. Equally, the lay faithful are terrorized by fear of the hostility, ridicule, and hate that will be visited upon them should they object to the imposition of LGBT ideology. For example, in 2015, the congregation of St. Nicholas of Maya in the Archdiocese of Dublin gave a standing ovation to their parish priest when he declared from the pulpit that he was gay and urged them 
to support same-sex marriage in the Irish referendum. It is not difficult to imagine the kind of treatment that any objector would have received. Thus, the oppressive influence of the anti-church is most clearly seen at work when a person is fearful to openly uphold God's revelation about homosexuality, abortion, or contraception in their parish community. Indeed, faithful Catholics, both lay and clerical, are increasingly subjected to a legitimate fear that their livelihood and careers would be in jeopardy should they stand up against the anti-church. Employers are particularly fearful when activists of secular groups level charges of homophobia or transphobia against their faithful Catholic employees. Dreading the potential loss of business, employers in these situations often feel constrained into silencing or even dismissing accused Catholics. While bad publicity from the LGBT lobby can damage business, most employers have an even greater fear of the adverse legal judgments that con conflicts with such, groups, with, with, with such groups can bring them. Even so, one should not ignore the reality that there are st still other employers who would readily acquiesce to complaints against a faithful Catholic because consciously or unconsciously, they are in sympathy with the anti-church. As is well known from numerous test cases, when employers are faced with pressure from LGBT activists, freedom of speech and freedom of conscience of their employees are disregarded, if not suppressed. Most faithful Catholics, especially those working in the public sector, know this. They feel intimidated and so keep quiet about their opposition to secular ideology. Priests and bishops are the immediate and more natural leaders of the laity, and they, above all, are caught in the broadening spectrum of fear generated by the anti-church. Additionally, because of the clerical vow of obedience and respect, their fear, be it reverential, is greatly aggravated, especially when they find their ranks divided, their unity split, long-standing sacramental disciplines violated, canon law ignored, the evangelizing spirit dismissed as proselytism and solemn nonsense. In regard to their persons, they labor as little monsters throwing stones at poor sinners, or who reduce the sacrament of reconciliation to a torture chamber, or hide behind the church's teachings, sitting on the chair of Moses and judging at times of superiority and superficiality. As clerical sons, they see themselves as less deserving of a papal embrace than Italy's arch abortionist Emma Bonino, and even less worthy of rehabilitation than renowned false prophet and global population and abortion advocate Paul Ehrlich. As priests, they are told they owe an apology to gays and that the great majority of Catholic marriages they would have, pres they would have blessed are invalid. In addition, they're called sayers of prayers, and for considering mass attendance and frequent confession as important, are branded Pelagians. As Catholics, knowing that the five first Saturdays were requested in reparation for blasphemy against our most blessed lady, they are personally affronted by the scurrilous musings that, on Calvary, where she became our mother, and indeed the mother of all those redeemed by Christ, the Holy Virgin of Fatima perhaps desired in her heart to say to the Lord, lies, lies, I was deceived. As trees of the forest shake before the wind, so clerical hearts quake with fear at the possibility that they could actually be more Catholic than the Pope. The advent of Pope Francis has, in the divine order of things, proved a great and true blessing. A hidden conflict has been raging in the church for over 100 years. A conflict explicitly revealed to Pope Leo XIII, partially contained by St. Pius X, and unleashed at Vatican II. Under Pope Francis, the first Jesuit Pope, the first pope from the Americas, and the first pope whose priestly ordination was in new right, it is now full-blown. 
with the potential of rendering the church smaller but more faithful. Consequently, there is a budgeting fear among the more astute of the clergy who, because of their training, education, and expertise in matters ecclesiastical, are generally able to see further and understand better than the average layperson the fallout from either an open conflict or the maintenance of the status quo. The apostolic exhortation, Memorius Laetitia, is the catalyst that has divided not only bishops and episcopal conferences from each other, but priests from their bishops and from each other, and left the laity divided, anxious, and confused. As a Trojan horse, Amoris Laetitia spells spiritual ruin for the entire church. As a gauntlet thrown down, it calls for courage in overcoming fear. In either case, it is now poised to separate the anti-church of which St. John Paul II spoke from the church that Christ founded. As the separation begins to take place, each one of us, like the angels, will have to decide for himself whether he would rather to be wrong with Lucifer or right without him. At this point, if Amoris Laetitia is interpreted in continuity with the doctrine of the magisterium, the conflict will continue surreptitiously as the anti-church not only flourishes best in doublespeak, ambiguities and uncertainties, but also fears the census catholicus. On the other hand, should it be interpreted as actually contrary to the perennial magisterium, it is difficult to conceptualize how an open break can be avoided and even more difficult to predict the fallout. It falls to Pope Francis, whose charism is to confirm his brethren, to resolve the doubts arising in the wake of Amoris Laetitia, and until he does so, great fear is being generated by the uncertainties the separation will precipitate. If, however, it is remembered that the one called to be united for, how, if, however, it is remembered that one is called to be united first and foremost to Christ and through him to those who belong to him, then this fear will be greatly mitigated. To further reduce our fear, it is necessary that we face squarely the reality of our situation. That is, since ignorance is a cause of fear, we must both admit that there is a problem and identify the nature of the problem. Thank God this work has already been done for us by St. Pius X, who unmasked modernism the, as the enemy within, by John Paul II, who alerted us to the anti-church, the form of the enemy within, and by Pope Paul VI, who, on the 60th anniversary of the miracle of the sun, described the extent of the success of the enemy within. The tale of the devil is functioning in the dis disintegration of the Catholic world. The darkness of Satan has entered and spread throughout the Catholic Church, even to its summit. Apostasy, the loss of faith, is spreading throughout the world and into the highest levels within the Church. Grappling with the thought that the evil of the great apostasy of which the Apostle spoke could actually be imminent and hearing of its source, magnitude, extent, influence and power, we are naturally overcome by fear. To conquer our fear, we must first identify and overcome its various manifestations. Given that we love the shepherds whom Christ has placed over us as the guardians of our souls, our fear is reverential. Our fear can also be considered grave, since the thought that the true church could disappear or that the teaching of error could be attributed to her would disturb even the most steadfast among us. We must therefore be zealous and ready to defend the church, first, by living its teachings uncompromisingly, second, by preaching its truths courageously from the housetops, and third, by being willing and ready 
like the Maccabean martyrs, to die for it. Thus, fear's first manifestation, laziness, is overcome. A consideration of the fact that we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out should be sufficient for us to overcome shamefacedness, the second manifestation of fear. The loss of our jobs, positions, titles, families, friends is of little import as long as we can remain faithful to Christ's church, which is the light he has placed on the lampstand to give light to those in the house. The Apostle's joyful resilience after suffering dishonor for the sake of the name illustrates shame. Fear's third manifestation can be con conquered when one realizes there is absolutely nothing to fear in being ridiculed or abused or punished for doing what is right. We are overwhelmed by a fear that is essentially extrinsic inasmuch as the unthinkable suddenly becomes possible. It is with amazement that we observe that the church we love and know to be the bark of Peter, while under attack from all sides, is drifting perilously like a ship without a rudder, and indeed shows symptoms of incipient disintegration. We gain encouragement from the gospel story of the apostles who, while the Lord slept at the stern of the boat, were caught in a violent night storm on the Sea of Galilee, and though frightened, work all the harder to bail the water. Far from being paralyzed ourselves, we should therefore, like them, work even harder, all the time calling on the Lord who sleeps in the bark of Peter. Lord, do you not care? We're going down. Thus, amazement and stupor, the fourth and fifth manifestations of fear are overcome. The present situation in the church and in the world is a consequence of our infidelities and sins as Our Lady made, had made abundantly clear 100 years ago at Fatima. Our sins make us anxious, especially when we realize that we are once again responsible for crucifying Christ, albeit in his mystical body. Knowing, however, that God is always ready to forgive and to show mercy to a repentant sinner, let us beat our breasts, saying, Lord, be merciful to us sinners. And we would have overcome anxiety, fear's sixth manifestation. At baptism, we became members of the church militant, and at confirmation, soldiers of Christ. We therefore have been recruited and armed for deadly combat against the three implacable enemies of our souls the world, the flesh, and the devil. Recognizing that, we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the world rulers of the present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We fight, like the apostles, taking the martyrs for our models and Christ Jesus himself for our reward. Since our Lord has told us explicitly that we should not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, we can immediately dismiss those whose greatest in injury to us is in the material order. Christ, however, does warn us about the soul killers, namely the many false prophets who will arise and lead many astray, especially those prophets who show signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Further, since the world will, be, will speak approvingly of these false prophets, they will, they will readily be believed by people who will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. These then we should fear because they lead poor sinners to eternal damnation, as much with the multiplicity of words and writings that dilute the rigor of the gospel as their deliberately ambiguous and confused affirmations. Whilst it is true that we should be wary of those who, like Eleazar's friends, with their specious reasoning and counterfeit compassion, seem to have our best interests at heart, ultimately, however, it is the creator of all whose law is life, 
whom we should fear. God has told us to listen to his son, the rigor of his son's gospel, that is, those things that in the words of St. Vincent of Lorenz are believed always, everywhere, and by everyone, is what will save our souls. Any dilution of the rigor of Christ's gospel, whether in the name of modern scholarship, or in light of new and more profound understanding, or out of mercy, not only reduces it to a human gospel, but also by proposing only a pharisaic righteousness does great spiritual harm to souls. The salvation of souls is the supreme law. This was the reason that 100 years ago, our most blessed lady came to Fatima and convinced three young children to embrace an austere lifestyle and to practice rigorous penances that the souls of poor sinners may not fall into hell. Encouraged by St. John Paul II's first words and confident in her promise that in the end my immaculate heart will triumph, let us not be afraid. Rather, let us be strong. We will not give in where we must not give in. We will fight, not hesitantly, but with courage. Not in secret, but in public. Not behind closed doors, but in the open. Audemus fide nostram defendere, non timemus. We dare to defend our faith. We are not afraid. Thank you.